Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani. You're watching Daily Debrief. Uh, it's Monday and on the show today, we're talking about the implications of the war in Ukraine for West Asia and beyond. Uh, we're looking at a rail workers strike in Canada and developments in Spain on the football field with El Clasico happening last night. First up, Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad is in the United Arab Emirates on a historic first visit to an Arab neighbor since civil war broke out in that country 11 years ago. Uh, signaling a potential thaw in relations between Syria and other Arab nations that have held the nation in isolation for the past decade or so. The US has responded by calling the visit profoundly disturbing. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, who are OPEC's two largest oil producers, uh, have rejected President Joe Biden's pleas to increase oil production in order to push down prices and provide extra supplies to enable Western sanctions of Russian oil and gas imports. Boris Johnson was earlier unable to convince the U.S.'s old friends to join in, in on the sanctions uh, imposed on Russia. Saudi Arabia have also invited Chinese President Xi Jinping for an official visit and Riyadh has indicated openness to pricing oil sales to Beijing in Yuan. Uh, meanwhile, India is considering establishing a payment mechanism in local currencies to allow it to continue its trade with Russia. New Delhi is proceeding with purchases of Russian crude at discounted prices despite serious pressure from the U.S. Uh, the state-owned Indian Oil Corporation concluded a deal to buy 3 million barrels of Russian oil. To connect all the dots for us and tell us why perhaps the only good thing to come out of the war in Ukraine may be a reduction in Washington's influence and interference in West Asia and beyond is Prabir Purkayastha, the editor of NewsClick. Uh, Prabir, uh, the developments we listed uh, just a few seconds ago, how are they significant? You know, there's a much longer history of West Asian oil and it starts really with uh, the discussion really post-war, uh, Second World Second War, World. that the Saudi Arabian oil would be under U.S. protection. <coughs> of course, the other protection that was offered to oil producers in West Asia is at the time United Kingdom, mm. which was Iran, which was also had some of the other protectorates over there. So all of that world has changed considerably today. But the one thing which was constant was Saudis backing the dollar and really shoring up so that the oil market was always priced in dollars post Second World War. Of course, it is also even today, Qatar and United Arab Emirates mm. are big players. Yeah. Uh, Qatar when it is, comes to LNG, but also oil and uh, United Arab Emirates primarily oil. So if all of this is taken together today, West Asian oil is very important for shoring up the dollar. dollar. That's mm -hmm. one thing which is very clear. Because if we look at the other big producers, Venezuela is under sanctions. Russia has come under sanctions. Mm. Iran, is, Iran under is, sanctions. is under sanctions. So given all of this, if West Asia breaks, then the only people who will be pricing the, the oil in dollars will be the United States. Right. So this is a huge change because Part of the dollar being the international currency is also its link to the oil, which is a very, very readily fungible commodity, mm. which is, you know, which is all kinds of uh, trade that goes on into it, oil futures, etc., etc. So when gold goes off as a currency, in fact, the U.S. Post Bretton Woods had the dollar as the linked to gold. Mm. When it goes off gold in 1971, it's really Saudis guaranteeing that they will always price all their oil purchases in dollar, which kept the dollar as a global currency. Yeah. Will that change? And I think if oil ceases to be priced only in dollars, mm. and this is what Saudi Arabians have said, I think it's a huge, huge signal. Then the other part, that U.S. is not able to impose its sanctions on uh, Russia. Big buyers like India have said they will buy. And it's also very logical, given the fact that oil has started again to go up. It's $106 uh, Brent crude per barrel. It's, it was $60, $65 last year. Yeah. So it's already gone up. And it can, as we know, has uh, could, could go up even much further. Mm. So given that, the Russian oil being out of the global market is not going to help countries like India. Yeah. So both India and China have agreed that they will buy Russian crude. Now, in spite of all the tensions between India and China, on these issues, 
they are all on the same boat because they all need gig oil. oil. And you also have even Pakistan saying mm. that they welcome India's independent foreign policy. You have yeah. a strange mixture mm. that the oil states which are under their umbrella breaking off in some sense from the United States, mm. trying to work out their independent equations, going to Moscow. Saudi, they, they had the uh, United Arab Emirates who are in the forefront of uh, the battle against Assad along with the Saudis. Yeah. Now hosting uh, Assad, Assad in uh, United Arab Emirates. Mm. So all of this seems to show a break of what used to be the earlier you know, alignments. And this seems to be going towards a much more multipolar world. Mm. Uh, and the, the single largest contribution today is really the kind of sanctions US, impo US imposed on Russia mm. with the West and other countries following suit and Japan. Mm. I think that has shaken up the world's confidence on the dollar economy. And some of the big things we are seeing are really the fallout of that. Of that. Uh, from an internationalist perspective, uh, Prabir, how do you see some of this sort of playing out in the short to medium term? Uh, and how, how, how will this realignment actually look? See, it's a, it's a little premature to look at the uh, you know, pre, uh, what will be the kind of alignments that will mm. happen. Mm. The question that has been raised, if dollar goes off as a preeminent global currency, currency, is there something which can replace it? Mm. Or will you have multiple reserve currencies? Mm. And countries will choose what currency that they will hold their reserves. Uh, hold their reserves or what currencies their transaction be indexed to. Mm. Now, if you take, for instance, Russia and India, now, rupee ruble is fine that mm. they will mm. hold it in Russia bilaterally. Yeah. But the question is, how will the price rupee or the ruble? Mm. It seems to be now they're going to price it against the yuan. Mm. Why is it so? Because in both this as a supplier and as a buyer, China is very important to Russia. Yeah. And in India, as we know, though we do supply a lot of goods to China, but it's a much bigger supplier. Mm -hmm. So because of China's weight in international trade, today it's the largest trading partner for 80% of the countries around the world, mm -hmm. which is a very, very sharp change from what it was 20 years back mm -hmm. when the reverse would have been true. Yeah. United States would have been 80% yeah. largest partner for 80% of the countries. Mm -hmm. So given that, what we already see in Russia, India exchange, that they both seem to be willing to index their currencies to the yuan. So de facto, it's a rupee ruble agreement, but underlying it is also that there is a yuan component to mm. it. So can that start <clears throat> happening? Some may say, okay, we'll do a X, Y exchange, but it'll be indexed to dollars. Somebody else will index it to the yuan. Mm. So all of these are now likely directions. And uh, people have now been writing that the end of the dollar is coming mm. because the United States saw the, what under it their uh, global dominance mm. was the fact that the dollar was a universal currency for countries. Yeah. Now, if I hold my surplus as a country in dollars mm. and United can, United States can seize it, then there is no incentive for mm. me to hold it in dollars. Mm. And why would I even build up a surplus, which is at risk then in the currency that I hold it? Mm. Because I can't hold it in my currency. Mm. The surplus doesn't make any sense mm. unless I hold it in gold. So these are the issues which we thought the world had settled in Bretton Woods post Second World War. All of these issues are now coming to haunt us. And all of this threaten after about 80 years, yeah. the uh, the dollar supremacy. But you know, reserve currencies have changed. We have had florins uh, 400 years back. Mm. We have had uh, pound. Mm. And the sec post Second World War, we had the dollar. Mm. So I think this is showing that it is no longer possible to have one, one. currency which will underwrite everything. Mm. Otherwise, you get back to Lord of the Rings, one ring to command them all. So I think we are reaching that kind of scenario for global finance. All right. Thanks so much for that, Prabhu. Right, next up, the Canadian Pacific Railway halted operations and locked out workers over, lab over a labor dispute early on Sunday. Each side is blaming the other for a halt that will likely dis disrupt shipment of key commodities at a time when prices around the world are already soaring. Uh, joining us for more on this developing story is People's Dispatch's Anish. Anish, first up, what is the dispute over? What, what are uh, workers asking for? 
Like the main uh, question is on wages, benefits, and uh, healthcare. So among the things that, because it's a new contract that they're negotiating, it, they want uh, better wages at the, at the time when actually workers, transport workers across North America, and not just North America, but across the world have uh, been at the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. So they want a better uh, terms and conditions for their work, for the work that they have done so far. Mm. But uh, on top of that, the sticking point is the control of working hours that uh, CP Rail or the Canadian Pacific Rail is trying to uh, keep it keep to itself and not give workers any discretion. Mm. Uh, one of the issues with that is because they're trying to push for a, uh, a sort of uh, federally mandated uh, layover uh, prog uh, time schedule which will actually which can actually share, extend uh, you know uh, a single uh, working hour to up to 36 hours for right. a single route right. for a person. And more than that, they're also trying to push for one-man crews in many of the trains, wow. which is uh, which they're saying will be tec uh, technologically as uh, you know uh, assisted, but still it is going to be a significant impact. We are talking about 20,000 kilometers or so of rail right. route mm. that spans across North America, much, uh, major parts of North America, uh, and uh, at least I think eight or nine states in the United States included. Wow. So this is something that cannot be done uh, without actually increasing manpower and you cannot have uh, ideally uh, a working schedule that can actually put workers uh, you know mo put more burden on workers mm. than mm. Uh, you know than anything else all right and and what is the likely impact because like you pointed out this is a major railroad uh, that covers a vast sort of exactly, chunk of yeah. north america so it's bound to have a massive impact on freight uh, and therefore supply chain yeah, so you know, much most of uh, the freight uh, transport in North America is rail based. In fact, that is what most of the railways there are Do. for. Yeah, exactly. And so, in that case, uh, this is going to impact significantly on grain transport, which is one of the key things that CP Rail is known for. Mm. Uh, grain transport has already come down quite significantly uh, <laughs> for the past one year or so. Uh, it has come down to r around 40% of what it was in the pre-COVID levels. And this was before uh, the sanctions on Russia, the, san uh, the war in Ukraine. And so you have supply chain disruptions around the world, mm -hmm. and which includes grain uh, shipments uh, all, all over the place. Right. Secondly, uh, it is going to impact the port of Vancouver, which is a major, major international port for North America, especially the northwestern central uh, part of the United States, which includes Chicago and other major cities right. uh, as well. So if, and that, uh, it covers around 70% of the region's, uh, you know, international shipments. Right. So if shipments are not being transported out of the port, it is going to block the port as well. Mm. The port had seen uh, a couple of years ago, I think in 2020, where there was a massive port uh, worker strike as well, which was scuttled by the government mm. because of the nature of it. But this time, it is not the workers that are responsible for it. We are seeing the company itself announcing a shutdown much before it. Okay. And lastly, it is the fertilizers, uh, potash, uh, Canadian potash, which is important for uh, U U.S. farmers, especially mm. in Central America. Uh, is going to be disrupted. 70% of, uh, or 75 percent of Canada's fertilizers are transported by CP Rail. Okay. Uh, and you know, major parts of uh, United States depend entirely on this uh, f uh, fertilizer shipment by CP mm. Rail. Mm. So this coming at the time of spring, yeah. when uh, you know you are going to get into the new cycle of yeah. agriculture is going to impact farmers even worse. Mm. So this is, uh, and farmer, when we talk about farmers, we have to remember much of that is agribusiness, yeah, is agro-corporates. Yeah, yeah. So agricultural corporates and corporates in general have, uh, you know, sounded alarm over this uh, disruption, but we have a situation where the company is not ready to negotiate and mm. the workers really want what they are due for. All right. An important story then for, for multiple reasons exactly. and for multiple angles, uh, Anish. Thanks so much for that. Keep an eye on the story for us. We'll be back for updates later. Uh, and finally, last night in Spain, Barcelona, a resurgent Barcelona, beat Real Madrid by four goals to none uh, in the El Clasico, which is the Spanish derby in the biggest game 
in Spanish football. Some would argue the biggest, one of the biggest games in all of European football. Uh, Pierre Emerick Aubameyang uh, scored two and assisted in his first El Clasico after transferring over from English club Arsenal. For more on this, uh, for the resurgence of Barcelona and why we are talking about a football club in the middle of everything else that's going on in the, wo uh, in the world, is uh, Newsclick Sports Editor Leslie Xavier, who joins me, uh, joined me earlier sorry, uh, via video conference. Leslie, I believe you uh, had a rare late night last night. You were up watching the game, which was quite uh, uh, actually early in the morning, uh, India Standard Time. Uh, how did you see Barcelona doing and what signs are you getting of a side in, in the middle of some kind of resurgent process? Uh, so, the uh, main interest was Barcelona itself because after Xavi coming in and the signings over the winter, the team has been performing really well and uh, it was very, I mean, I was very keen to watch them play against Real Madrid and see how that, that happens because, of course, the title race Mathematically, yeah, it is at stake. But again, we know it's 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 quite impossible to catch Real Madrid at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, what's at stake was that uh, to bring out that message across to the fans as well as within the team circles itself and the board as well that the team is well and truly on its way to uh, reconstruct from from whatever that was left in the common era. So, in that regard. Uh, they have taken the right steps forward. So it's easy to probably say Oben Yang's form uh, after being signed into the into the mix. Uh, it's it's doing great. Yeah, you might have a grouse on that because he's no from. no grouse no grouse. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, he's in tremendous form. And uh, but there is a larger scheme of things that is that is playing in the in this, which is. Uh, Xavi as well as John Laporta, John Laporta, who was who was also there in that mix when when original resurgence happened under right card in 2003-2004. So there are already people are talking about parallels between those two teams, and it's hard to miss also. And the parallels is not exactly stars aligning or something like that. It's simple football logic that's been applied. They are getting in youngsters who are valuable, who are of worth, who are proven in various other leagues or other clubs. They're bringing them in. They're mixing them with the existing stars or uh, linchpins of the team that are, that is there. So it was uh, that that's uh, that's been executed so far uh, at the, at the ground level, at the at the execution level on the on the during the matches perfectly by Xavi and and the, and the support cast around. So we can make that comparison if you want if you want. Uh, in that sense, uh, 2003 for Oben Yang was Edgar Davids. He had brought in and he was in tremendous form the moment he got in. And uh, uh, Philip Coco was in the mix, uh, Victor Valdez, uh, Puyol, Luis Garcia, Gerard Lopez, and a young Iniesta was coming into the mix, into, into his strike. And they were, I mean, they were joining existing superstars like Ronaldinho, Javier Saviola, and all that. Yeah. So that was the mix there. And now it's uh, Ferran Torres. Old man Daniel Reyes is back. Adama Traore and these two uh, Torres and Traore have been in great form. I mean, they are they are teaming up well with Aubameyang and uh, Jutiga, Eric Garcia, Nico Gonzalez. All these players who have been brought in, and they again Gerard Piquet, Sergio Busquets, Jordi Alba. They are there. They are there as the stalwarts. So it's like like the cliche that goes right. A good mix of youth and uh, Youngsters as well as experience, so yeah. uh, it's sound logic. So it's it's also a sign how to rebuild the team. So we have seen uh, seen some very rich English clubs struggle to come out of an era and look forward to another era. And so it's not about splashing money. It's not about uh, uh, bringing in stars to play for them. It's also about making the right investment and. That is where I think the model in which Barcelona or some of the Spanish clubs work, where it's the board that I mean, it's it's not privately owned. That way. it's the board that makes the it's the members that make the decision, and so democracy to an extent works. I mean, to a, I would say to an extent because it's always uh, there are yeah. a lot of yeah. And so that shows in how these clubs have been able to bounce back. Even Real Madrid, any of these clubs, you pick, they have been able to bounce back from 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 that lull period, which is end of a generation and the start of another generation and then come back into into where they where they are
Right. Yeah. And, and of course, another reason why we're talking about Barcelona is because it's always been historically, Leslie, uh, more than just a club like their own, uh, I think, tagline goes, uh, going back to the times of the Spanish Civil War and, and Franco's dictatorship where Real was Franco's club and Barcelona stood in defiance and, and therefore got, uh, I think, uh, a fan base around the world to kind of show solidarity and rally around it. Uh, I think, uh, Leslie, thanks for, thanks for that little bit on, on Barcelona. We'll be talking a lot more about football this year on Daily Debrief, of course, because it is a year when we'll see the first uh, Winter World Cup to be held later on in Qatar. Uh, but for now, that's all we have on this episode of the show. For more details on all of these stories, you can head on over to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and give us a follow on all the regular social media platforms for updates. We'll be back all this week, uh, Tuesday through Saturday. So catch us same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.